Excellent job, Patrick, on that. Uh, we really appreciated getting that data as a water treater. Uh, it was very interesting to see the story that was told by having monthly testing versus uh, quarterly. So, very good there. So, we started off with forming a team. We told that team they needed to describe the building system, which they did with flow diagrams and, and, and written flow diagrams. And then Patrick told us that uh, we need, and this is where I have caution, we needed someone with some expertise related to these systems, and particularly uh, as related to legalosis, to identify risk areas and then determine controls. I think the fourth step that Patrick just went over, that's the heart of a water management plan. That's where you're saying, here's the opportunity to control this pathogen and here's, here's our plan, here's what we're going to do. And of course, you have to do it. So, anytime you're monitoring something, uh, yeah, you have expectations, and as you said, as Patrick said, you have to have limits, but then you sometimes are out of limits. So, my section, monitoring and corrective actions, is where we are on five, and so this is the, the plan called for by the uh, Ashley. So, Wow, I'm going to go back to the CDC toolkit. This is the easiest way to do this. I think I asked this before, but how many people have seen the CDC toolkit? Ooh, folks, that's the free thing. Google. <laughs> you have to buy the X-ray standard, someone asked earlier. And so, but that's the toolkit that came out in June of 2016. Also came back out pretty much the same with a focus on healthcare facilities in June of 2017, but it just put in, I, I spoke with the CDC, they said, you know, Bill, the ASHRAE standard is kind of written in engineering language, is for engineers, so they took this document and I think did a great job of giving graphics and putting it in a, in a layperson's use. So when it gets to this section of uh, corrective actions, it gives us examples, and again, I hate to have to read from a, a picture or a slide, but this is what's in the toolkit. And let's just take this very first one. The first example was corrective actions for biofilm growth in a um, fountain. So apparently the description of the building showed that there was a fountain, maybe in the lobby of this hotel or this hospital. Area. And so uh, the, the, they identified that as a risk. You know, uh, Legionella has been found in water fountains and has been associated with the transmission of disease because it's an exposure source. And so the, uh, the corrective actions were in the water management plan was to do a lot of stuff. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll see what it's going to get to here. And maintaining, first of all, follow the manufacturer's recommendations on the water fountain. If you're going to keep it, if you're going to have it, this water feature, then follow the manufacturer's recommendations on how to treat it, the frequency for cleaning it. Uh, I've been involved with a lot of cases. Uh, uh, you want to make it pretty, so you put in lighting, right? You put in lighting underneath, but make it, look, don't use incandescent lighting. That's a nice heat source, use an LED source. So anyway, all of this would have been probably involved with writing the water management plan for uh, this fact. So during her weekly visit inspection uh, in the lobby, Michelle, what's Michelle? Michelle Patterson notes that the fountain walls have accumulated a slimy growth. So the water management plan said weekly, inspect that fountain, go to it, look around, fill it. So when she felt that, then it called for the action, or that was an out of control. You shouldn't have the biofilm. So as indicated by the water management program, Michelle immediately shuts off the fountain, drains it, and scrubs it with a detergent recommended by the manufacturer. Again, all of this is in the plan, it's in the program. She follows the program's startup procedure because the water management plan has a shutdown, has a startup procedure written as part of the plan to refill the fountain with water, and then she checks the residual disinfectant. So there's a treatment program for that fountain. The water management plan says, okay, the fountain also was treated with less, probably chlorine. And she checks the disinfectant level to make sure they're within control limits. Then the plan says she documents for Patsy, I mean for her observations, 
and the performance of the cleaning in her logbook, and then she informs her supervisor. I mean, th this is the simplicity of, of, of uh, again, the CDC toolkit. So let's take another example, because this is very important. And I think at this point, remember, I kind of stress, we've got to be thinking Legionella now. Think Legionella. Use the, the knowledge base that you have gotten, not just in today's presentation, because I know you've had other, you had Legionella 101 and, and, and everything else, but apply it. Use that knowledge base. And so um, this is part of the place for unoccupied floors. The eighth floor of the building is being renovated and is closed to the public. Okay, Jason understands that this may cause a temporary hazardous condition because water usage will decrease. Up there it will age. Up there it will be without disinfectant. Up there it will be stagnant. Up there it will grow by with them. All the things we've been saying. What was that? Touchdown for you? Temperature? Be warm. Disinfectant? None. Flow? Stagnant? None. And its use. So, they this was identified uh, in in from in the risk section, and uh, uh, controls were to when you have a condition of unoccupied, then you'll go down and and, and have a flushing program. So after two, uh, after discussing the issue with the supervisor, Jason counteracts the potential for stagnation by daily flushing the sinks. That's right. He didn't just decide then. The plan said, if you have a, a floor or a section of the building that's going to be unoccupied for a certain period of time, here's what you must do. So he does the flushing on the sinks and fixtures with hot and cold water, sample rooms. I think Jen said anytime she's away from her home, she comes back and sort of does the same thing. You get all the old out, and you get new in, and what's going to be new coming in? Some disinfectant. So part three. Jason also increases monitoring of temperature and chlorine levels on the eighth floor from weekly to daily. Instead of doing it weekly, now the action for the management plans is do it daily, and for the duration of the uh, renovation, he documents the method and duration of flushing, records everything, and reviews the documentation, uh, documentation for the supervisor. So this goes on and on. I, I think we've got, I have plenty of time for this section. I thought it was going to be a 20 minute section. We've got 30, but we're going to get to the QA. So let's do the cooling tower. Happy brought up the cooling tower. Uh, we know it should have a water uh, treat program. But the water management plan, according to Ashley 188, says during the weekly inspection, so part of that plan is hey, let's inspect this cooling tower on a weekly basis. Michelle, discovers that leaf litter has accumulated in the reservoir. It's not uncommon. The cooling tower is an open uh, device, open to the, uh, uh, it's an open recirculating system, open to the air, stuff can get in there. Uh, apparently this gets in there. So upon further investigation, she finds that a panel uh, has become dislodged. Lure that should be keeping that stuff out, allowing this windblown debris to enter. And so after replacing the panel and skimming out the debris, Michelle checks the disinfectant level. Did that have any effect? Did all those organics, all those leaves and whatever come in there, maybe did it drop our disinfectant level down if it was chlorine? And, so she, and then she decides, let's go ahead and do a, a bacteria test as part of the program to find that the conditions are still within control limits. Remember, we act when things are out of control limits. We test to see what the uh, what the levels are, and when they're in uh, control limits, we're okay. When they're out, there's something that should be done. So she documents her actions in her law book, makes a note, checks the disinfectant levels daily for a week. The regular plan is weekly, now she's going to do it daily to make sure everything's back in control, and then she reviews her actions and documentation with her supervisor. So this is the pattern for out of control actions. Some of these sections are, are, are pretty pretty simple. The important part is it's got to be written in the water management program according to the other steps of looking for the risk, identifying the risk, and then implementing control measures. Just because there is a risk area, you may not have a, a control to implement, and this will come back in, in validation. So one thing that is not written in the uh, CDC toolkit, as an example, 
but it's in the ASHRAE standard. It's every section, the hot and cold water, the cooling metals and everything. You need to have a contingency response plan uh, as a corrective action uh, for any suspected uh, cases of legionellosis. So you'll see in this case, I pulled out 7.1.4, which is the potable hot and cold water system. And it just says the, the water treatment, or excuse me, the water management program shall include these items with respect to a contingency uh, response plan. Those are procedures to be followed. You can read it. Uh, are there any directives issued by national or regional? That talks about if the program team determines testing for Legionella because it's suspected maybe testing is not part of the plan. And that's, that's, a, that's probably the most common question that I've, we've been asked about the ASHRAE Standard 188. Does it require Legionella testing? Is Legionella testing mandated? No, it is not. And, and part of why it took 10 years to, to, to develop. But it was just felt that that was something that should be left up to the team to decide so you don't have this just broad paintbrush covering everything. Uh, I have another colleague when they do presentations like this says, you know, the good thing about ASHRAE 188 is you get to make a lot of decisions. The team gets to make a lot of decisions. And the bad thing about 188 is the team gets to make a lot of decisions. If you aren't capable or prepared or able, and don't feel bad if you're not. Your maintenance people should know the water systems as it relates to their job, but they may not be a legionologist. <laughs> they may not be an infectious control person and, and can relate that to legionella. So I said earlier that this is probably one area in the development of a water management plan that you will need some help. You will need to maybe have a, a consultant involved. Now here's where I have changed my tune over the years because I've seen some mistakes made in this respect. And is Brian still here? Brian was talking about uh, learn from our mistakes. I got a little slide for you here in just a minute, Brian. Okay. Uh, I have found out that, you know what? Do not just say, well, you're probably going to have to hire a consultant to get you a water management plan. And I do that. You need to be as part of the development of that water management plan program as you can. You don't have certain areas of expertise about Legionella or infectious uh, or Legionellosis, then you know, use that. But don't just hire someone and have nothing to do with it because you're not taking ownership of that plan. The plans I see that work the best are those that are owned by you know, the facility that's been involved with it. With that said, I, I'm just trying to throw in, because I know we have some spare time, some other tidbits about water management programs, which is what this whole thing is covering, is that you want the water management plan to not just be a one-time deal. It was done, the notebook was made, and put up on show. It's a, it's, I hate to use this term over and over, it's a living document. Uh, even ASHRAE 188, I told you earlier, is a under continuous maintenance. It wasn't just one standard that was written and, and then that's it, cast in stone. It will change over time. Uh, some of these systems that we were talking about, ice machines and all, that was just in 2013 that we learned of that. And who would have thought? You know, but there was a, a, a UPMC, large medical facility, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, they had a patient in intensive care who was diagnosed with Legionnaire's disease. And the people were scratching their head. And they couldn't understand why, because this was before Actuary 188. But this facility had a very robust, they didn't use the term water management plan. They had a water safety plan. They were not only testing their cooling towers for Legionella, they were testing their potable hot and cold water systems for Legionella. And they felt good because they didn't have it. But now they've got a patient who's been diagnosed with Legionnaire's disease who's been there well past the two to 10 day period. So it was a confirmed hospital acquired case of Legionnaire's disease. But, and of course, if you're in intensive care, you're not in good shape anyway. But someone said, well, you know, he's always able to have is these little ice chips to kind of keep his mouth off. That's how they discovered this will 
let's check our ice machines. They have a huge number. They found 20% of ice machines have over 3,000 CFUs per ml per milliliter of Legionella pneumococcus cerebrotoin. So we continue to learn. So the CDC added that to the list. I always use this one kind of as, as an example. But, uh, and I don't have a great picture or graphics, but I think you had one earlier. Who would have thought going to the grocery store you know, uh, would expose you to a disease, a deadly disease? In fact, who would have thought going to the healthy part of the grocery store, the produce section, where all that fine vegetables is being sprayed with water? Think Legionella, water. So the CDC is great in investigations. It was, it was in Louisiana, Bogalus, Louisiana, in the late 80s, where there was an outbreak. Some, uh, I think, in the 15, 20, over a dozen people. There were two deaths. There was a, a, a grocery store where all the endpoints came. So they go to that grocery store, they look around, they say, hmm, I wonder what, what's this? So they go back into the room behind the grocery, to the produce section, there's a little device, it was an ultrasonic misting device. It was one of those out of sight, out of mind. No one in the world, no one. It, stuck, it just sat there, filled up with water. It was near heat generating equipment, like Patrick said, a ice machine is. They tested that. A ton of leaves now, again, the officer Rick Warren. So that put those mixers on. So this is how we learn, and, and we're constantly thinking. So uh, our contingency plan. Uh, our, our water management program has contingency uh, response plans for all of your devices that you've identified, like cooling tower or the potable water system here. So, how many times have I said, learn from our mistakes? Kind of makes you, uh, a, another way to put it is, you know, we need to have good judgment in, in what we're doing. And uh, uh, we all know that what good judgment is, it, it comes from experience. I guess that begs the question, well, uh, where does experience come from? Well, that comes from poor judgment. <laughs> so, so the takeaway here is let's learn from the experience or the poor judgment of others, and let's incorporate that into our thinking, you know, Legionella. So uh, these corrective actions, uh, learning from our experience, thinking Legionella, uh, is it, 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 it important. Wow, construction, we've heard that several times today. New construction, well, what can go wrong with new construction? That's gonna be great, everything's gonna be new. Or renovations, healthcare facilities constantly have renovations. We have so many outbreaks associated, so many uh, cases of Legionnaires disease associated during these periods of time because you uh, are gonna invariably have water interruptions. You're gonna have maybe uh, what I call plan breaks, or maybe not plan breaks. So, uh, we have a lot of uh, outbreaks during that time. Uh, we mentioned these low flow. Oh, that should be a key, because I told you it's a very important word. Stay out of the bad temperature range, have a good disinfectant range, have a good flow, no stagnation, no dead legs, not let biofilm grow, and, uh, and have a, a, a bacteria growing, Legionella growing. So, we just learn these, these systems have been associated with, again, disease contraction after installation. Uh, in summary, so we can get to, uh, well, I guess Patsy is going to follow up during the lunch. A, a lot of questions came out. You know, I kept saying, well, if we answer a few, but you're going to be here for the Q&A, so we'll get to that. So Legionella is a common bacteria found in our environment. We know that. Uh, I also try and say this, <laughs> so it comes to your mind, Patrick said, yeah, some people say uh, it's, it's, it's uh, ubiquitous. And actually, uh, that's another funny story, it was written way back when the tie-in with Legionella being discovered to be in our potable water systems, yes, our water systems that we shower and bathe in and drink and all, as opposed to only cooling towers, all the cooling towers are source. So in the early 80s, research, uh, we've got Legionella in our global water systems. And it was published in the very prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. And the title of the article, it was, a, a it was actually Janet's research being uh, published, 
uh, was the ubiquitous uh, Legionella uh, endemic to a hospital system. Well, it was appropriately used in that because that hospital had endemic, meaning uh, all the time occurring cases of Legionnaire's disease. And when they got the checking and testing, they did. They found Legionella bacteria in 99% or all the samples. And so when you go look up the word ubiquitous, what does that mean? Everywhere. It was everywhere in that hospital. But from that point on, you can just start looking at all the literature, everything you read about Legionella. Legionella is a ubiquitous, <laughs> ubiquitous it starts off that way. It's very common in the environment, very common. It might be ubiquitous if you include the, the testing, the DNA testing for fragments and dead leftovers, but it's very common. And in our building water systems and our potable water systems, it's about 50%. It's a big, broad range. A lot of studies will show 25, 30, on it to 70%, so we just kind of split it 50%. The reason why we get the word ubiquitous is because it's been used, I think, inappropriately uh, in water management plan strategies and decisions to test them by saying, well, there's no need to test because it's everywhere. Why test for something that's everywhere? Does anybody have that? Why test for something that's everywhere? To me, that begs the question, well, if it's everywhere, and it's a waterborne pathogen. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? <laughs> and passing's going to tell us that you better be validating a water management plan. That's all right. So I'm going to conclude here, see if there's any questions, and then we'll uh, get to the very important part of the plan, I think, is the verification and validation. But we have time. If there's any quick questions. Without further delay, thanks, Patsy. Thank you. So good afternoon. Y'all still hanging in there? That's great. Um, so my name's Patsy Root. Is it, we getting reverb? No? You good? I have that loud mother voice still. So, <laughs> um, so my name's Patsy. I'm the Regulatory Affairs Manager for IDEX. Uh, I've been with IDEX for about 13 years. Um, I'm also one of the signers, developers of Ashray 188, along with Bill and Patrick. Um, I also belong to CWWA with Brian, and I also belong to the Association of Public Health Laboratories. I've done a lot of educational work for them. Um, I've been on a couple of the US EPA's Federal Advisory Committee Act committees. And I've been involved in method validations, uh, laboratory accreditation. I sit on the executive board of directors for laboratory accreditation in the US. Um, so I have a lot of different hats that I wear. But the, the most important thing to me, um, as far as my work right now, is to help folks like you understand what the steps are so that we can learn how to mitigate the risk of Legionnaire's disease so people can stop being sick and die. Because as everybody before me has mentioned, this is something that is highly preventable. Um, it depends on us to have the intestinal fortitude to implement measures that will get us to a place where we are actually managing this disease and people are not being affected by it anymore. So what I'm gonna talk about are the last two steps of water safety management planning. Step number six is verification and validation. And this is where we're at here. And in the single figure from ASHRAE 188, it's under confirmation. So ver verification, I walk around a lot, so if you can't hear me, raise your hand, okay? So verification and validation are two different things, all right? Verification will confirm for you whether or not the activities of your plan are actually being done. So Patrick and Bill talked a lot about you identify what the hazard is, you put control measures in place, and then you monitor them, right? So we've talked about all that. What verification is, is rather like your internal audit. Did everybody do what they were supposed to do? And you have a little checklist. Validation is what you do to ensure that your plan is actually effective. Am I actually managing Legionella and Amophila in my system? And we all have talked about, that's another point I wanted to make, is that we've all talked about managing Legionella, managing the risk, managing that. 
I hope that you all understand that this is not something that we can actually eradicate because Legionella bacteria are a normal waterborne bacteria that are always going to be in our environment. It's not like what we're used to in typical distribution systems where we see bacteria and it's an indication of a find and fix, right? Legionella are normal. They've been here for a long time, longer than us. They're always going to be around. So, um, so a verification process, and this is one of my favorite sayings from Reagan, uh, is to trust but verify. You trust that your water safety management team has done all of these steps, created a plan, they're looking at the plan every six or nine or 12 months to ensure that there aren't any changes that are needed to the plan. But they're actually performing all of those monitoring activities. So verification is to confirm that the control measures of the plan are being performed and appropriately responded to. And again, it's very much like an internal audit. So I have a couple examples here. So say for instance, that you've identified that the hydrotherapy pool in, in the hospital or in the hotel or wherever you are is a risk. There's potential of hazard there, right? So you've said, we want to make sure that we control the risk by <laughs> implementing a chlorine level between 0.5 and 0.7 ppm. It has to be tested daily, and you've identified who's going to do that. The results are recorded in either a paper or an electronic logbook. If the PPM of chlorine goes below 0.5, then the person doing the verification will make sure that the spa operator adjusts the range and notify the contact person in the plan on the team who can cascade information to the right people and make any necessary corrections. So the individual that's actually tasked with performing the routine verification check will look at logbooks. They'll um, make sure that all the values have been within that 0.5 to 0.7 ppm. And they'll note if there were any actions taken, if, the, if it was outside of those parameters, and take any corrective, and if the corrective actions were taken if needed. And everything is documented, right? Another example might be, and I know I'm not supposed to call it a boiler, sorry, Bill. Uh, <laughs> the, the, okay, what's the right term? Water. water heater, okay, maintains a temperature of 140, because we've talked about the fact that, and I apologize, it's in Fahrenheit, I'm US, we're backward. I'm, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we have to maintain 60. Okay, it says 40, 140. Um, and that it has to be tested daily, and if it's below 140, then there are activities that are supposed to happen by the person that's responsible for checking it, right? So what the actual verification is, is to go look at those logbooks. Did the person check the temperature every day? Was it at least 140 or 60 Celsius? And if it wasn't, were the correct actions taken, right? And again, everything is documented. So the verification, in case you haven't got the message, is the internal audit. This is the plan, and somebody over here is tasked to make sure the plan actually got done. Okay, because as Patrick said before, and I think Bill as well, bless you, you can't just write a plan and say, we have a plan, and then go stick it on a shelf somewhere. Because that is ineffective, and it's not protective of public health. It is a living, breathing document that has to be worked on every day. All right, uh, that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we all get it. It's the end of the day. I totally understand. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so validation. Validation is what you do to make sure that your plan is actually effective. Well, how do you define effective? The level of bacteria in the system should stay at a certain level, right? And your team has decided what that level is. And if it goes above that, then something has to happen. Your plan's not effective. There are two major ways that you can actually validate that your plan is effective. 
The first way is that you can do clinical surveillance. You know what clinical surveillance is, right? So if you're in a hospital or a nursing home or something like that, you would wait for um, a case or an outbreak of Legionella pneumonia. <laughs> Legionella pneumonia. That, to me, does not seem very protective of human health. <laughs> so the alternative way that you can validate your plan is actually test the water and make sure that the level of bacteria is staying within a prescribed concentration, okay? That would be my choice. If I were writing the plan, that is what I would do. So the thing is though, is for those of you that are in water distribution, um, you're probably used to looking for, and I think we looked at these before when Jen was talking earlier, what we're used to in distribution water, municipal water works is we're looking for those pathogen indicators that tell us that something has happened in the system. We look for coliform and E. coli to tell us we have ingress, to tell us we have a break, we have a low pressure event um, or something like that. And you test above and below where the positive sample was and you can identify the actual place where something happened and you fix it, right? So what we're used to with testing water for bacteria are the sort of find and fix things that I said before, all right? And we use indicators for that because coliform aren't like taxonomic, right? It's a whole group of, of bacteria that, you know, they're, they, you know, ferment lactose and they produce gas and they, that's how they're described. They're not actual pathogens. They're indicators, they're surrogates that maybe there might be a pathogen there or not, but that's what we use, okay? With Legionella, we actually test for the pathogen. It's sort of like what we do with Cryptosporidium or Giardia testing. We're actually looking for the thing that is going to make you sick, okay? So it's pretty different what we're testing for, and I just wanted to reiterate that, okay? Um, so before you actually decide to do testing as part of your validation step of your plan, you have to decide who to work with, right? Is anybody here from a laboratory? Hey, Rhonda, I know you are. Yeah, nobody else. Okay. Has anybody ever had to contract with the laboratory to do testing for them? Right. So when you do that, you have to decide what are, what are my criteria going to be to decide which laboratory should validate my test, my, my plan by testing, right? Because when you have your validation testing done, you are going to get a result. There's some number of Legionella and Ammophila per 100 ml, you're gonna get a result. That is your data that tells you if your plan is effective or not. So you want to make sure that whomever is going to be doing that testing knows what they're doing because you're making decisions on that data. So my recommendation and the recommendation within ASHRAE 188 is to use a laboratory that is accredited to a national or international standard, right? And in Canada, I believe that you ascribe mostly to um, ISO 17025 as the basis for your laboratory's accreditation, right? And there are lists from like Kayla and SCC. Those are two accreditation bodies in Canada that you can get lists of accredited laboratories in your region, okay? So taking a sample. Earlier today, we talked about um, taking a water sample. And when you're taking a sample for Legionella and Ammophila testing, it's pretty much just like in the routine water safety management plan validation world. It's just like taking a coliform E. coli or a sample for beach monitoring or a sample from the wastewater, right? Anytime you take a bacterial sample that's going to go to the lab for testing, I strongly encourage people to wear gloves <laughs> because you wanna be sticking your finger inside the lip of the bottle because then the bacteria will get inside of there. Um, when you would need protective equipment is if you're going in and it's outbreak investigation and you know that they're probably high concentrations and you're going in a cooling tower, taking samples from the bottom and the fan's blowing. Turn the fan off, you can probably wear a mask, you definitely wear gloves, and then you can take your samples. 
The good thing about using an accredited laboratory is they will give you instructions how to take the sample. And they will give you a chain of custody form, right? It's like whomever holds that sample is the owner, right? So if the laboratory has the bottles in their, lab, in their, in their facility and they give them to Bill, Bill now owns those bottles, right? And he has to sign the form. And then say Michelle takes a bottle from Bill and goes to the, the drinking fountain, fountain over here and takes the sample. She owns that and she has to sign the form. So having a chain of custody tells you the history of that sample throughout the life of its testing because testing starts from the time you take the sample, okay? So now you understand how to choose a lab. You understand how you should be taking a sample. What about the methodology, okay? So there are various analytical culture methods that are used for validation testing, all right? The first one is done on specialized solid media that has what's called buffered charcoal yeast extract, and it's black. It's cool looking plates. Really hard to read if you're a microbiologist, you will understand this, right? The other way of performing culture is in liquid. And this is very similar to um, what we do for regular drinking water. For coliform and E. coli, you can either do them in um, the solid plates, you can do the media in tubes, or you can do them in quantity trays like this. This is our method that we developed, which is called leach work. So liquid culture or solid plate culture, those are the kinds of culturing methods. There are also other types of methodologies that you can use that are based on antibodies and DNA te technology, te DNA technology, okay? But our um, US CDC recommends using a culture method because then you can keep the isolate in case anything ever happens down the road and you wanna compare it to a human sample, okay? So, when we talk about routine testing, I'm not talking about outbreak investigations or anything like that. I'm talking about the testing associated with the water safety management plan. When you do your testing, right, you're, you're hoping, right, you're hoping to stay within a certain level. Might not be zero. Right? You're hoping to stay within a certain level, right? And then at some point, you may see this blip, right? And what that does is it tells you Something about your controls or your monitoring is out of control and you need to go investigate. Routine monitoring is watching, 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 waiting for a blip. That's all routine monitoring is, whether it's routine monitoring associated with this, with drinking water, wastewater, beach monitoring, or anything. It's all the same principles. Now, when you use um, solid media or when you use liquid culture media, you get two different kinds of reporting units on your data report from your accredited laboratory, all right? If you are using solid media, what happens is the bacteria land on the plate, sometimes one, sometimes a little clump of them, and then little colonies grow up, all right? And you count the colonies. And with liquid media, you have a bottle and you pour it into, say for instance, the quantity tray and it gets separated into little tiny individual culture squares on the tray and you look for a color change, all right? The way those are reported to you is if you're using a solid plate, it's reported in colony forming units or CFU. If you're using liquid culture, then it's reported as MPN, most probable number. And every regulatory body, whether it's in Canada, US, Europe, Australia, China, Japan, they all recognize that those types of units are used interchangeably, right? So in other words, if your limit is 100 organisms per mil, right, it can either be reported as 100 CFU per mil or 100 MPN per mil, and those are considered equivalent and used interchangeably. Does that make sense? Okay, so there are several of these BCY black plate 
auger methods that can be used to identify Legionella and Mothla. Um, and this is one example of them. This is from ISO, the International Standards Organization, ISO 11731 method. And what it shows here is it shows that you have your sample at the top and you have to sort of understand if your sample is going to be clean or not. Like for instance, if there's uh, potable water, it's probably quite clean. If it's a cooling tower sample, it may not be quite as clean. Um, so if you feel like you have a fairly clean sample, you can take 0.1 to 0.5 milliliters of that liter and put it directly on these plates and then incubate it for 10 to 14 days. And then you read the CFU, okay? If you have a sample that's maybe not so clean, there are manipulations to that sample that you do to get rid of some of the non-targets, you know, some of the pseudomonads or the other Enterobacteraceae or any of those other things because you want just the Legionella growing on the plate as much as possible, right? But it takes a really long time for Legionella to grow, so sometimes those things that you don't want there can overgrow. So you do these manipulations like subject the sample to higher heat, um, subject the sample to an acid treatment, dilute the sample, and de various different things that you do to try and get a plate that you can read, all right? Because you can only read, I think standard method says 200 colonies per plate. They're about this big. So that's the ISO method. The CDC method, the CDC has a method that they developed as well. A little bit different in the manipulation of the actual sample. Um, GVPC and PCV stand for the antibiotics that are added to the plate because antibiotics on agar like this will, will kill the bacteria just like they'll kill the bacteria in your body. Um, and then there's acid treatment. And I don't remember if they do heat on here. I forget. I don't think they do. So, so there are various ways that you manipulate the sample when you're doing this. The problem is, is when you do that, there's also the opportunity to sometimes kill targets or lose targets. Yes, ma'am. I got five minutes. Gee, <coughs> hers. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. So this is an example of what a plate looks like when it's done with the BCYE based method. Um, this is the liquid culture method. You add 100 mils of your sample. Let me go back here. To this... Uh, three-sided sort of, it's a stiffer than a bag, but you add it in there and you seal it. So you end up with all these tiny individual little cultures in there. You incubate it for seven days and then you read your results and that's reported as MPN. So your data report that you will get from your accredited laboratory will give you the information about that sample and you'll be able to go back and look at your plan and tell, you, tell your team if your plan is actually effective and you're staying within a prescribed concentration. And speaking of prescribed concentration, everybody asks me, well, what level of Legionella is safe? The answer is nobody knows. And if they tell you, they still don't know. Not kidding, okay? Um, there's never been a, an epidemiological study to understand the infectivity or dose response rate for Legionella and Nemophila in humans. Um, it, it really does depend on those three factors, the strain, the exposure, and the person's susceptibility. I remembered the word. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I was going on for a second there. So... Uh, for non-potable water, these are some of the action limits that are in various guidances and rules around the world. But the important thing to understand here, and I said it in the beginning, and I will say it a hundred times or more if I have to, you need to have consistent, reliable data to make sure that you understand if your plan is, is actually being effective, right? And it's important that your plan is, is effective because nine out of ten cases, according to CDC, Nine out of 10 cases of Legionnaires, uh, Legionella pneumonia could have been prevented if that building had implemented a water safety management plan. So, summary. Verification confirms that your plan's activities are being implemented. Validation confirms that it's actually effective. 
Verification and validation uncover any issues. <coughs> Testing for the pathogen reduces risk and cost. And my favorite. So speaking of documentation, I really actually have one thing to say. I mean, everybody's talked about what you have to document and all that other stuff, and you will have these slides, so we'll make sure we make them available. But <coughs> honestly, this is why. Because if you don't write it down, it's like it never happened. And if you go to court and you're standing in front of the judge and you say, but we tested, the judge will say, show me. Yeah. If you haven't documented your stuff, you can't prove to them. And that is why everything needs to be documented. You need to be able to prove to yourself and others that you are actually doing the right things. And if you ever do end up in a situation where you're in front of a judge, you will be very happy that you've documented everything. So I put some additional resources on here too, but at this point, we are going to go to a Q&A session. Good? Okay.